Hello and welcome everyone. It is the pleasure of the Rubicon Masonic Society to bring to you another episode of Virtual Masonic Education. This episode marks the 20th in our education series entitled the 21st Century Conversations on Freemasonry. This is the 39th virtual education since we started in 2020. As we all know, to be a brother in our fraternity is a privilege. It is an honor. So let us always be mindful to utilize the tools provided to us in our education this evening to help us better understand ourselves and to achieve further light in masonry. For those of you who are returning visitors tonight, we thank you for coming back. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we welcome you and thank you for being with us this evening. First, I would like to recognize the Masonic sponsors and participating brothers who are helped facilitate to put on these virtual Masonic education series. William O'Ware Lodge of Research, I would like to thank Worship Brother Dan Kimball and Worship Brother Tom Nitsky. On behalf of the Rubicon Masonic Society, I would like to thank Worship Brother John Bizak, Worship Brother Alan Martin, Worship Brother Jerry Johnston, Worship Brother John Sissel, and the rest of the Executive Committee and Brothers of Rubicon. Uh, brothers and friends, my name is Brian Evans. I'm the past Master of Lexington Lodge Number 1, Chairman of Rubicon, and it's a pleasure again to be with you this evening. Worship Brother Tom Nitsky, would you please deliver the opening devotion? Brethren, if you'll... Uh, Tom, I think you're muted. <clears throat> Hopefully that's better. Here we go. Good. Uh, brethren, great architect of the universe, as we gather together today for this meeting, may we be guided in all the way we say or do by a strong sense of your presence with us. Grant us for our labors the wages proper for us, the corn of nourishment, the wine of refreshment, and the oil of joy. May our meeting together on this day be such that nourishes and sustains us in the work which is ours as Masons. May the friendship we share as brethren give refreshment to our spirits. May the proceeding in which we are engaged and the friends we greet today give us a joy that encourages us, revitalizes us, and adds deep meaning to our lives together. Amen. So, uh, so, thank you, brother. Brothers and friends, the purpose of our Masonic education is to assist in the improvement of oneself by establishing a deeper understanding of Freemasonry, of its tools, of its traditions and practices, and further cementing the brotherhood of our fraternity for the betterment of mankind. As you know, any opinions expressed during this virtual Masonic education will be those of the presenter or the participant, and they do not necessarily reflect their views of any lodge or grand lodge or the Rubicon Masonic Society. By participating with us, you can send to our guidelines and our full disclaimer, which can be found at rubiconmasonicsociety.com slash disclaimer. Going through the rest of these protocols, please be mindful that these are not tiled meetings. Masons and non-Masons are more than welcome to attend and participate. So please be mindful that anything discussed should be suitable for all of those involved. Gentlemanly manners are to be expected at all times. No alcohol, no smoking, no eating or foul language permitted, please. There will also be no discussion of politics or religion. Attendees may be removed if not following these protocols. In an effort to best assure that this virtual education is as enjoyable as possible, just some quick reminders. Recommended attire for each meeting is coat and tie. Please type your name and any appropriate Masonic title or location under your video so that way you can identify yourself to others. If you're not a, um, if you're not a Mason, please type guest after your name. Please enable your video camera so other attendees can see you. Please reduce background noise and keep your microphone muted when not speaking. Please turn off all other computer programs to eliminate outside distractions. And finally, as always, please be patient should any technical difficulties occur. Brothers and friends, tonight's guest presenter is Worshipful Brother John Bizak, PhD. John is the author of a dozen popular books about Freemasonry, along with dozens of essays, commentaries, and other papers about our craft. His other books and writings address the subjects of leadership, criminal investigation, police standards, and the behavior of organizations and their administration. He speaks nationwide on a variety of issues related to Freemasonry, the fraternity, the criminal justice system, and critical thinking. A list of his current and upcoming publications can be found on his website, which is thecraftsman.org, as well as Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Noble, and other Masonic outlets. Worship Brother Bizak was elected to two consecutive terms as master of Lexington Lodge Number no. One in 2018 and 2019 in Lexington, Kentucky. 
He's a fellow and former member of the board of the Masonic Society, a current member of the board of the Masonic Restoration Foundation, vice chair and founding member of the Rubicon Masonic Society, third vice president of the Philalethe Society, co-editor of the Transactions of the Rubicon Masonic Society, volume one, and co-producer of the Masonic Table, the documentary that was just released in May 2022 about Masonic Festive Board and Harmony Dining and Freemasonry. John is also a member of Alba Lodge number 222 in Washington, D.C., and is a life member of Kentucky's William O'Ware Lodge of Research. There, he was named to the initial class of fellows and serves as the chair of the research committee for William O'Ware. For anyone that has the pleasure of knowing John personally as I do, know and would absolutely agree that John is a true gentleman and friend of the highest caliber, and he will go down in history as one of the greatest Masonic scholars and leaders of our fraternity. Brothers and friends, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce you to now, tonight to my dear friend and brother, Worship Brother John Vizek. Thank you, brother. The floor is yours. Thank you, brother. Good evening, brothers and friends. We're speaking tonight about a book called Island Freemasonry. And that book is about the growth of Freemasonry in the United States and how it outpaces development, especially during periods that um, it experienced unbridled rapid expansion and left in its wake many lodges that while properly chartered and set to work were otherwise unequipped to practice and observe the intent of the founding design of organized Freemasonry. Put simply, Freemasonry in the United States grew faster than the institutions surrounding it had the capacity to properly instruct, support, and govern. And while the book narrates the story, the story is told by those who actually made it observed it, wrote about it as it was unfolding, and who preserved it in our lodges and our lodge records and our grand lodges and many other official public and official documents. The book draws on a factual history and it places it against the context of the times in which that history took place. And it gives us answers to questions about how the fraternity finds itself today. And in many cases, why? The title of the book, arose from conversations with past Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, Thomas W. Jackson, past Grand Master of Kansas, Michael Halloran, Pete Norman in Texas, and Brent Morse. I'd use the term islands of Freemasonry to describe lodges in the past and the emergence of lodges in the 1990s that appeared out of what Tom Jackson called an ocean of ordinariness that had blanketed American Freemasonry since the 1960s. The term island Freemasonry then came to represent those lodges that had and continued to appear out of that ocean by either starting new lodges that pursued what we call today observant practices or lodges that were pursuing observance in already established lodges, where in order to practice it, the culture of the lodge first had to change to accomplish that. The question was how to change that culture without creating an undue level of disharmony in a larger culture that was granite-like in its belief about what Freemasonry is. As our friend uh, Andrew Hammer often says, it's, uh, it's impossible to be properly observant of anything that the time and effort has not been taken to understand. And that is also the crux of the idea and the genesis of island Freemasonry. Now, the intriguing part of the research for the book to me was how obvious it was from our own records, how and why the fraternity that surrounds Freemasonry began and continued to unmoor itself from the roots as a philosophical and educational institution. And to lay that foundation with proper context tonight, I'll read some passages directly from the book that offer the findings and perspective that might lead us into a further and a, a deeper discussion. With so little emphasis on the richness of the fabric of Freemasonry in ordinary circles, the vision of what the craft could be instead of what it has become created the signature of both the early interest in observance of Freemasonry and an offshoot now referred to as Island Freemasonry. These things arrived at a defining moment in American Freemasonry. Neither should ever be expected, however, to create sweeping changes in the way mainstream Freemasonry sees itself. They do, however, serve as a bastion 
with those seeking more than the mainstream Masonic experience and an ongoing labor to preserve its heritage, the design and historical intent of the craft. Their arrival grew out of decades of Masonic stagnation and excessive hand wringing about the steady exodus of members suggesting that a failure to retain members might actually exceed the perceived problems of attracting them in the first place. Treating the process of being made a master mason as an event instead of a process has greatly contributed to that problem. And in doing so, it's left too many members to believe that being made a master mason, at least in title, is the finish line. Now, by the late 1960s, the public, had begun to largely ignore the institution and its members and leaders began to offer more excuses for the unexpected membership decline than suggestions to effectively address it beyond efforts to try to just add more members. In the 1990s, the belief that technology did not affect the institution was proving wrong. The deliberate oversimplification of intellectual content with an eye towards simply keeping things going had manifested most overtly in the form of new slogans and the easing of standards of the mainstream of the fraternity grew more casual in its appearance while its deteriorating facilities served as a metaphor for what had and was happening. And in many cases, the metaphor applied to what was going on inside of those facilities regarding their practices, protocols, and Masonic instruction. Throughout the 1980s, the fraternity and its leadership remained largely focused on how to fill the empty chairs in Lodge rather than focusing on what contributes to making those chairs empty. There were, and there are today, exceptions, of course, but the generation or more of men less instructed and educated in the heritage, practices, protocols, and historical aim and intent of the fraternity than even the generation immediately preceding them. Why is anyone surprised that American Freemasonry during those decades radiated all the predictable signs of organizational death throes? Now, one reason is that it's difficult to see what's happening in a picture when you're inside the frame. While dim reflections of the historical Masonic heritage endured in some urban and rural areas, there's no question that retrospect, in retrospect, that the Masonic product was not only diluted during that period of the 60s through the 90s, but was actually showing signs of significantly fading. So it's with a twist of irony that the factual history of Freemasonry the very thing Masons ignored for generations underscored not quite a movement, but a new wave of interest, as it were, that is more likely to preserve that heritage in the end than pedestrian mainstream Freemasonry. Losing knowledge and then finding it is symbolic in our craft, where we are all charged with searching for the truth. So the new wave of interest could not have come at a better time. One would think that Parades would have been held, festive board feast planned in honor of this new wave that held such promise following the long walk in the wilderness that Freemasonry had experienced over several decades as it moved from trying to manage growth for 16 years to trying to manage decline for the next six decades. The resistance to the very notion that Freemasonry could be practiced in a manner other than the ordinary was not widely embraced then or now. Nevertheless, Providence smiled on the craft and a few Masons around the country armed with the working knowledge of our heritage and embodying the true essence of free thinkers continue to withstand the doubters and the old cultures, as well as those who merely kept the seats warm in their lodge as they ignited a very small but powerful undertaking. But to better understand why such a movement ever emerged requires examining how Freemason managed to dilute itself as soon as it began to rapidly expand along with the new nation. Now, one of the reasons is worth repeating, and it is continually found in our own records, and that is for almost two centuries, most of the American fraternity and many of its leaders focused their concern primarily on the empty chairs in our lodges, rather than focusing their concern over what it is that makes those chairs empty. Now, from another section of the book, as soon as the words like Renaissance, reform, restoration began to appear with regularity in writings by men like Kent Henderson, Tony Pope, 
Pete Norman, Kirk White, Brent Morris, Chris Hodab, set against the ordinary backdrop of American Freemasonry, a spark was ignited. And in many Masons, it was ignited because they were looking for something more than they found when they joined the fraternity in the late 70s, throughout the 80s, and in the 90s. Practicing the ordinary had worn as thin as the membership roles had become. The men pioneering and advocating what had been described as a new wave of interest in Freemasonry believe men were now looking for something that can bring meaning to their lives. And while that may be true, we also know from non-evidence troubled research that men in the past and still today are attracted to Freemasonry for many other reasons, especially during the periods of unbridled expansion. However, there was a new wave of interest for sure, but not for what had become mainstream practices. The internet made these and other sources about this wave readily available to all nations. In fact, the explosion of the internet almost ran parallel to the wave of interest that was forming within the craft, a situation that might be considered somewhat similar to the introduction of Gutenberg's printing press which changed the world by making more knowledge available to more people about more things with which they previously were unfamiliar and had no immediate means to access otherwise. But like the period of Gutenberg's press was cha had changed the culture and dynamics of society and the world, many did not know how to read. It took time for that change to really make change. And since it had been, it's been well documented over the centuries that one seemingly inherent characteristic of many Masons is that they don't bother to read much about their craft, if at all. So that analogy appears fitting. These writers, however, planted the seed for another paradigm shift in Freemasonry through what we refer to and think of today as observant Masonry. And they did so by making more available their thoughts, their impressions of the future of the craft. And neither Grand Lodges or all the subordinate lodges were ready for that explosion of the internet and all that it offered any more than were churches and monarchies in 1439 when printing from the movable type made knowledge available to all who sought it. And it actually dealt that death blow to the superstitions of the middle ages. Not only did Masonic literacy, literacy advance along with the internet, but the promotion of Masonic education gain ground as well. New ideas began to flow through the veins of American Freemasonry and many jurisdictions discovered members obsessed with all things Masonic, including practices of the past, which by the way, was incorrectly construed as traditional, but that's another topic. That interruption of interest or that eruption of interest created what seemed to be an unending stream of ideas that were far from the ordinary Freemasonry practiced in America. Some jurisdictions somewhat adapted, some resisted, and some stood firm, holding up what they considered landmarks of the craft as a blockade to any perceived so-called changes. In truth though, landmarks, the traits and character of Freemasonry were never challenged by this new wave of interest so much as this new wave sought to return to the concepts observed in many of those lists of landmarks that first emerged in the 1850s. While regular chartered lodge, lodges practiced the ordinary, these so-called traditional models, or at least some of the practices, began to gradually appear in America, but the wave did not create a tidal wave of followers. The practices in these lodges felt and look different. And many continued to consider these differences as a threat to their lodge cultures, if not an outright attack on the ways of masonry. Now, since the intent of the movement was simply to integrate our own American Masonic culture with the early historical intent of Freemasonry, which was then and continues to be a successful model for experience in other countries, it was stunning that Grand Lodges and so many of their subordinate lodges would object. Now, those involved in or who support the principles of the practice of what we've come to call observance in Freemasonry do not ask that other Masons conform to their point of view. They do not or shouldn't wish to detract from the methods of others 
any more than they want them to detract from theirs. But no matter, the masses didn't migrate from existing lodges to join these new groups, nor did existing lodges show a great deal of interest in adopting their practices. The term elitist became common when speaking of these observant lodges, as did scoffing at the notion that a coat and tie, much less tuxedo, was necessary for the practice of the craft. The point of, the, of a respectful and elegant form of dress was completely missed by many, which further illustrated and offered just one more example of how woefully uninformed many Masons were about the heritage and practices of the fraternity to which they belonged. The observant uh, movement, if we can call it that, and the men in it have never been interested in conscripting every Mason, much less abolishing the ordinary practices to which most lodges subscribe. Their focus was on the more observant Masonic experience they wished to practice, as well as that were all well within the boundaries of many of the list of landmarks and respective constitutions of their jurisdictions. But by the turn of the century, the contrast between the so-called observant and ordinary Masonic lodges was, was stark. And that ra radical delineation would continue to glare as more pockets of the wave came into existence over the next decade. And the idea began to appeal to more Masons especially new and younger Masons. In a typical pass along style, though much of Freemasonry continued to apply a Band-Aid solution in the form of one day classes, reducing the age of membership requirements, watering down rules of solicitation, reducing time between degrees, passing and passing on insufficient instruction as men advance beyond their proficiency and too soon enter chairs to pass along more of the same. Although the proponents of the movement were persistent in making their interest and style of practice clear, they remained in disagreement between what the majority of the Masonic culture perceived the new wave of interest to be and what the advocates knew it was. The belief that their old lodge culture was never going to change hastened the formation of new lodges. This further tarnished the movement in some main, mainstream circles where these lodges and the movements to create them were viewed by some as a slap in the face, implying that old lodges and the culture they represented didn't understand what Freemasonry was all about. Again, the point was missed. And it wasn't until the Masonic Restoration Foundation, MRL, was established in 2001 that there was any, so to speak, umbrella under which this new wave of interest stood in unison. The goal of the MRF is to restore Freemasonry to the historical and philosophical intent of its organizational founders under the belief that in doing so, the craft might eventually return to the development of fraternal cultural learning of learning and intellectual growth, benefiting not only the individual, but society as a whole, of course. It's important to note that support of the MRF, that the, those who support the MRF operate solely under the, the Grand Lodge in whose jurisdiction they're chartered and they have an independent existence from the MRF. They also made it clear that the formation <clears throat> of a, their formation was not for the purpose of founding Masonic lodges, orders, conclaves, encampments, or rites, and nor would they attempt to create charter or establish Masonic lodges. They claim no authority, no authority over any Masonic body. The lodges involved to improve fellowship, improve meals, create study groups, author and publish degree booklets for classes, train instructors, create and expand Masonic libraries, and reintroduce education presentations and discussions about masonry during lodge meetings which are all the very same and many more of the same recommendations that have been made since the early 1900s through the 1930s by many Masons, their leaders, Masonic scholars, as found and shown in our own publications and our own records. Importantly, they sought to abbreviate the stale business meeting model that had too long been one reason long identified for men losing interest in Freemasonry, fading from the ranks and contributing to poor levels of participation in their lodge. Eventually it became more common to hear visitors in these lodges say, 
I wish we could do this in my lodge. Some that attempted to make that wish a reality, they did better than others at achieving it, but there's no study or central repository of information that allows us to accurately measure that. Those who travel extensively, however, see these lodges in one stage or another, or becoming a hybrid of practices of the wave that fused into what is thought of as mainstream masonry. Now in closing that new wave, the observant lodge or the island of Freemasonry approach or any other fresh approach of restoring the heritage of a craft that may arise in the future is unlikely to see a rapid expansion. This long-standing granite-like culture of the past may appear to be cracked today, but it's not completely eroded by any stretch of the imagination. And it's not gonna merely step aside or even moderately adopt what might grow between those cracks only because it appears. So it's future generations, brothers, that are gonna determine what course is believed most constructive for the fraternity, thus Freemasonry. And a guide to that foundation on which to build the current course, reform or reshape or to merely tweak it as may be required will always depend on what the majority of the active and involved members of a lodge culture believe the aim and purpose of Freemasonry is. And what influences that level? The breadth and depth of the instruction new Masons receive. So in the matter of the lodge that was used as a central case study in Island Freemasonry, what changed the course of that lodge and the culture of it was the introduction and strict adherence to a more uniform comprehensive style of instruction that was provided as men passed through the degrees that focus on all facets of Freemasonry. That's what was at the foundation of what led to sustaining a course that resulted in most all of the constructive changes made in that lodge, all of which were brought about by the majority of the active and the engaged members who sought a new direction and more from their Masonic experience. Brothers, that seem like long passages, I know, but they're really brief passages compared to what else is in the book. So uh, I know some of you are in lodges that consider themselves observant lodges uh, even hybrids of observant masonry. And I know that Derek, uh, or, or, or he's still on here. Uh, let me see if I can find him. Daryl Gullick in Texas belongs to what I believe, uh, and haven't seen anything to challenge the fact, is the first what we might call observant lodge in America at College Station, Texas, St. Albans. So, um, any questions you have, any discussion you'd like to have about the genesis of not just observant masonry, but this concept of island Freemasonry, which really encompasses a lodge that is in existence, changing its culture so that it can adopt and adapt to the practices, um, we can certainly discuss. Thank you, Worship Brother. <clears throat> Brothers and friends, the floor is open for discussion, and I have a list of questions that I would like to uh, put you on the spot with tonight, John. Um, and I mean that in 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 good jest. Um, a lot of your responses, I think, I really just want to get more of your comments on certain topics. Um, nothing, nothing too off off topic, but because um, I think I know what most of your answers would be to a lot of these. First, tell me about your your opinion on how appendant bodies, um, uh, what role they play in island Freemasonry, if if any, in your opinion. Well, they play a role because they they certainly exist, and I think their role is important in masonry. Uh, we don't encourage men to immediately get raised to master mason and the next day apply for membership in an appendant body. We don't discourage him from doing it, never will, but we do encourage him to stick around. Getting raised is not the finish line, as I said previously, it's the beginning. 
stick around and see what else there is in the blue lodge. And let's, if you're going to go to another appendant body or to an appendant body, have the proper foundation, just like you need the proper foundation to become a, a master mason. It doesn't happen by moving men fast and quickly through degrees with uh, insufficient instruction and only partial proficiency to the suitability of a particular lodge. And when it happens in mass, and we have, um, I believe one of the brothers on one of our meetings, might have been John Cameron, I believe he's here tonight, who said that the journey through Freemasonry can be done alone, but it's best done in the company of other like-minded men or something to that effect. I believe the same thing applies to the impendent bodies. Uh, we've had people suggest that uh, men shouldn't go through them by themselves, that they go to a reunion, say to the Scottish Rite, yeah, there's some other brothers who want to go with you, form an alliance to go through that and continue on with it. And if that's where your heart is and that's what you wish to pursue, then pursue it with vigor. So I've had the pleasure of being a, an instructor with you in some of our Masonic classes that we've taught at Lexington Lodge number one. And I know you're teaching another one now, the Master Mason class. Um, so what has being an instructor meant most to you or what have you taken away most uh, when teaching your your classes as an instructor? I've been fortunate to be teaching classes since about 2011 and uh, have made a lot of friendships with Mason. Some are on this uh, meeting tonight who were in those classes. But I, I think the, the teaching all three of them at different times, seeing the transition of what we use in our classes that were started in 2011 when I think uh, Cameron who's on here tonight was master of the lodge um, we see an evolution we see men that start growing in stages we see men with a different interest in each of the degrees and we find that by going through all aspects of Freemasonry not just what we have to memorize and recite to prove our, deficient, our proficiency but all aspects and having discussion and not focusing on a rush 30 days to try to cram some memory work in, but to explore the depth of the degree produces a much more interesting candidate by the time he's through the master's degree. Uh, we have uh, one of the recent raised master masons on here tonight. He might want to elaborate on that at some point, but we see a difference not only in the quality of the candidates, but we see a difference in the commitment from most of the candidates. So would you say that um, Brother David Crickard was your most difficult student to teach? Uh, by far, there's been none more difficult than David Crickard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brother Crickard, I'll give you the opportunity to respond, please. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, worshipful brother, uh, both of you. So I, I don't know if I was difficult. I was just the... Uh, no. the most challenged uh, <laughs> to learn. So I, I do have a question though for you, Brother John, is like, so when did Freemasonry or Freemasons themselves become complacent? Do you think it was like, is it an American thing that just sort of happened? Like, did we not, did we always look at it as a, I guess a, I don't know, place to hang out instead of a place to learn or was it in in the colonies and the early American you know up until when whenever you think we did become complacent did they always practice observant Freemasonry or have we always been lazy in the United States for lack of better words uh, I think you have to explore first what what are we calling observant Freemasonry you know, we, we call it traditional Freemasonry or traditional observance. Um, you know, we run into a stumbling block there because uh, what's traditional? What was traditional when they first organized this? The very first meeting, that was the tradition? Well, they just started it. It was all an innovation. So I don't know when we can call it traditional, but what we can call it is observance of the historical intent of Freemasonry. We know when that started. Uh, we know the year, at least, that was on a constitution. We know the next constitution carried it forward in 1738, 
And we know we subscribe to much of that constitution today, although it's been taken in a variety of different directions because we have so many sovereign entities who are grand lodges and everybody is their own sovereign interpretation of, of what it is. But uh, no, I don't think complacency began uh, just recently, but I don't think it was always complacent. And I don't think it's complacent today. I think it's evidence of the men on this site uh, tonight and the, uh, what is it, Brian, 50 or 500,000 views we've had of these programs in the last three years. Yeah. I sure. think mm-hmm. that shows complacency at all, David. But I think complacency set in because in the very <clears throat> first rapid expansion of membership, we admitted thousands and thousands and thousands of men into the fraternity when the fraternity wasn't prepared to do anything more than run them through some degrees. The ones who weren't complacent, it appears to me that they were just overrun by those who became complacent. And we know what the process is. Lodges and Grand Lodges draw their members from our lodges. They have no other source. So if a lodge is complacent and they produce leaders, their leaders are gonna be complacent, most likely. And when men are elected to the Grand Lodge, if they come from lodges that are complacent, what other aspect can they bring to the Grand Lodge? And when we admit thousands of men at one time and growth that is extraordinarily rapid in five different periods of American Freemasonry, how can we not expect that to occur unless we pay more attention to how we provide education for members? Brother John, I definitely think education is, I mean, obviously it's key to Freemasonry, but Something that uh, we started at Lexington Lodge One was the orientation to uh, to not only you know make sure that the prospects are you know understand what is expected of them, but also to give them opportunity to say, "Hey, I'm I'm pretty busy right now, and you know I got a baby, and I got a wife, and I got a job, and." It keeps them from joining, becoming initiated, and then demitting, and ha- it'd be harder for them to come back after that, as opposed to say, hey, I'll see you guys in maybe eight years, 10 years. Well, you're right. Um, if a man doesn't have time for Freemasonry, it goes against the very concept that time is what he has to devote. And you have to figure out how to devote that time. And all of us have a different uh, way of doing that and a different struggle with it. But if it's to mean anything to someone, someone has to spend some time with it. And, and we don't discourage, discourage, as you know, any man who wants to come to Freemasonry. But we do ask him, if he's qualified, to come when you have time. Don't come when you know you can't even come to classes to learn about Freemasonry. Good questions, David. <clears throat> so, where's Brother Bizak? Let, let's continue down that that trail for a moment. And um, so, you touched on this a little bit in your presentation, but why, why, in your experience, do you think? What are the primary causes you think that have led to brothers uh, not coming back to lodge, not participating, demitting from the fraternity? Um, is it? Is it? Is it the fault of the lodge? Is it the fault of the Grand Lodge? Is it the fraternity in general? Is it their fault, a combination of all the above? Can you comment on that? Uh, Sure. I think it's a combination of all those things. Uh, And and we can start with the fact today, if we just look at today, brothers, instead of trying to look back, just look at today, what keeps a man from being engaged in Freemasonry? You've got a lot of options to do something else. And we're competing for those options. And he has to have it in his heart. He has to have the commitment. He has to have the interest. The lodge needs to inspire him to keep that interest if they admit him. And we can't always find cases where the lodge does keep men inspired. And we had uh, the occasion in the 90s uh, to see an essay and then in the year 2000, a book that gave Masonry a wonderful reason to blame everything else except on themselves for the lack of interest by the public and being unable to draw them into Freemasonry. 
And that was Robert Putnam's book, Bowling Alone, which is an excellent book. And I'm not disputing anything Mr. Putnam says, but I am disputing the fact that the, that the fraternity took advantage of that book saying it was the larger society or we lost the Vietnam generation. We lost this, we lost that. Other fraternities lost it too. And um, never once looking intently or consistently what's going on in lodges that might also contribute to that. Now, had we done that and found that we did everything perfect and it was the larger society, so be it. But we did not do that. And we have masons today who lived through that period and said everything was wrong with what we were doing because we couldn't hold anybody's attention because of what we'd become accustomed to doing. So we carry some fault for that and some responsibility. Uh, the competition today for a, a man's time is significant, but it was significant in the past too, and it was still done. But then we have to look at how many people come to Lodge who uh, may have had a burning desire to be a Freemasonry for years. And one day it just became too much and they left. There's just so many facets, but at the core of them, I believe it's admitting the candidates who have the time to pursue it. It's in the Lodge having the ability to continue to inspire and provide what men came to Freemasonry to do and a combination that you can't ignore of including a proper, suitable and appropriate Masonic foundation, instruction and education to members as they pass through degrees, not running them through then hoping they pick it up later. We've tried that and we can see how that's worked out but approaching and attacking this problem at the right end, which is when they come into the fraternity. So I have, I have an interesting one. So with so much outside hate and so much interior um, ordinariness, I had a question with you. I asked you a question one time we were golfing and I asked you, have you ever thought about demitting from Freemasonry? And, and you said, no, pretty staunchly. So, and I'm just curious, how did you take that question and why was your response so definite when you said, no, I have no interest in demitting from Freemasonry? And then what would you, what advice would you give to anybody that might be thinking that Freemasonry isn't giving them what they thought it would? Well, my answer was quick because I came to Freemasonry for uh, personal reasons to help me reaffirm what I've been doing in my life it was right. I looked for some affirmation and I felt it was right. And I felt like what I'd been taught by my parents and learned through life experiences and Sunday school and uh, every experience I had that I was on the right path, but I was at a point where I needed some affirmation and I thought I would find it in Freemasonry and I did. I didn't find the practices of the lodge I petitioned to, to be what I expected it to be, but that changed over time. But the advice I would give someone who doesn't uh, find what they want in their lodge is find other people who may feel the same way and change it. You can do that. And if you can't change it, find a lodge that offers you what you want out of Freemasonry. It may, may be a little bit more of a drive for you in some places, sure. but they're out there. Sure. And I know men who have done that and have driven 100, 150 miles, two states, just occasionally, not every meeting, just to get the Masonic experience they want to have. So if you have that desire for Freemasonry and you want to participate, you can help be part of the uh, process that can change it to some degree and level of satisfaction to the majority of the active and engaged members in your lodge uh, or find someplace else that already offers what you're looking for. David was right about one thing. We so rarely see a man leave Freemasonry to take a break or I've had uh, uh, a new baby and I just need to take a year away or I'm doing this or that. Who really come back? And we're not pointing any finger of blame to those men because there could be very good reasons outside of what we know, but the surface reason appears that if they didn't have a commitment to begin with and they stay away for that long and remain unengaged, the likelihood of them coming back shows in our records they won't be back. They may pay their dues, but they won't be back. Mm -hmm. So, so you mentioned um, 
Sunday school. So I'm going to go on that topic for just a few. And I'm not going to break any of my our protocols as far as discussing religion, but I do think that this is a worthy question. How do you respond to people that condemn Freemasonry and label it as a religion of sorts? How do you respond? Uh, I don't really respond to them at all. Um, I, if they want to have a reasonable discussion about it, I'll certainly do that with anyone. If they want to be blatantly ignorant about it and try to convince me that they're right without listening to reason, there's no need to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I don't. But if they want to listen to reason and they're genuinely curious, let's sit down and talk about that. And I think Masons are obligated to do that, although we are charged with not uh, getting entrenched and arguing with, I believe, one of the rituals says the ignorant. Mm -hmm. But um, I think we do have a responsibility to the craft and to ourselves and to the reputation of Freemasonry to explain in a reasonable fashion what it is and what it is not. And unfortunately, we, we have a lot of Masons who aren't able to do that. Right. Good point. Where's Brother Cameron Poe? I know you're probably not feeling well, but you sent me a message. And you said, don't blame the fraternity for the failings of its members. If you're up to it and want to want to add to that, great. But I, my initial response is, um, I think you're right. But I also think that the fraternity has, has a much larger role to play in... Um, who it brings in and what keeps them there. I think that, in my opinion, I think the fraternity has, has failed and is continuing to fail greatly in that respect. Um, maybe not as a whole, but from individual certain lodge levels. So I, I, I agree with what you're saying, but if, you know, if what they're getting is fish fries and everything else and it lead to nothing uh, other than that, you know, then my response is I, I don't necessarily agree with that response 100 percent, but not to put anyone on the spot. But you want to elaborate? Yeah, I'll I'll jump in and I, I apologize for my appearance. I just rolled out of bed. I'm, I'm battling covid right now. So <clears throat> forgive me for that. But that comment was basically um, an answer to if someone was going to demit. Mm -hmm. uh, it probably came in a little late after the discussion had already been had. But um that's that's what i have discussed with brothers who were considering demitting over something uh small and petty and ridiculous um i've always said to them you know don't don't blame freemasonry for for the idiots that are running it um and i stick to that and i'll i'll maintain that because i've had several opportunities where uh, people expected me to demit i've been through some serious um shenanigans in in my somewhat short Masonic career mm -hmm. and um, had plenty of reason to demit. And I'm not going to demit specifically because I don't blame Freemasonry for, for what's, what's going on. So um, I, I, I know that little short comment didn't make that clear, but no, that helps. That's, that's where I come from on that. Yeah. That's where I come from on it. And um, I'm not sure how everyone else feels, but I'll leave it at that. Oh, thank you. You know, I think that if somebody is willing to pursue the journey of education and discovery, that you can probably find more Freemasonry outside of your internal circle of Freemasonry. Uh, you just have to go about that process, find the right books, find the right people, and then you start to discover what Freemasonry is about, more so than where you're, who you rub shoulders with necessarily. Um, we have a couple questions here, and and. Brian, I'm going to call on you, Brian Carroll, and I know you're not able to join us um, with your video, but would you mind just asking your question openly for response? Uh, sure thing. Uh, <clears throat> I just got home, so I, I'm not going to get on camera. I'm coming home from work. But as I dialed in and I had it on the counter, my wife had dinner ready, and she was kind of just listening to the butt into the conversation. And she said, <clears throat> do you think Freemasonry has changed from the inception? I said, you mean she said well and i kind of summarized what she had asked so i'll kind of read it um do you think masonry has changed from the perception of the colonies and now as they were setting up a new world they needed that bond and that trust to each other to build the country versus now we're not doing that and we're not necessarily preserving masonry as it's more informative uh and the reason the reading i'm sorry readily available everything's readily available since the printing press so she said essentially 
so much has changed from the beginning to now is it that we're lagging as Masons, keeping up with the change in the world and trying to hold on to the past? Or is it that we weren't properly educated on what we were supposed to do in the beginning and we never had that opportunity to bring it forward? Thank you. John, oh, you're welcome. John, you want to offer a response? Yeah, I, I, I agree with many of your points, Brian. Um, education, I think, is the key. I'll give one example. Um, if a man is brought through a degree process and he learns a little bit of the proficiency, just enough to um, be declared proficient to the suitability of his lodge, and he's taught in all three degree classes that we came to Freemasonry because we are a charity. Now he comes into the fraternity with that as a central belief that that's all there is to what we do. That's all there is to Freemasonry. That's what Freemasonry is, a charity. Let's say he becomes an officer or he doesn't. Let's say he becomes an instructor. What is he gonna teach the people that he instructs? How is he gonna lead the concept of Freemasonry. So if we believe that education doesn't influence men who come into Freemasonry, we are just terribly mistaken, brothers. It has everything to do with a man's perspective after he's raised and gives back his proficiency and it becomes sort of on his own unless he pursues other avenues and continues to remain engaged. He's left with whatever the lodge culture is that follows whatever aspect that may either be most convenient or what the previous generation passed on to them. I see Alan shaking his head. I think he has experienced that recently. And, and I appreciate that that makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> Alan, do you wanna offer some comments as well? I will. Uh, I've been a Mason for seven years and when I was initiated into the craft, uh, I received uh, a Masonic education that was handed down to me by the individuals in the lodge that received their um, knowledge of Freemasonry. They passed it on to me and it, it, it essentially consisted of rote memorization of the recapitulation of the degrees where I memorized the proficiency questions and regurgitated those in open lodge, had no idea what it was that I was regurgitating or, or giving back in open lodge and um, nobody to explain to me the symbolism, the allegory of the degrees. And it really frustrated me. So in my visits to uh, other lodges, uh, in our area, in our district. Uh, I ran across several that uh, had, a, had implemented uh, a process of educating the members of their lodges. And uh, for lack of better terms, I really fell in love with that idea and that concept and ultimately ended up becoming members of, of those lodges just so I could get the Masonic education that my own mother lodge failed to give me and not uh, to any fault of their own. Uh, Worshipful Brother John, early on you said uh, it was hard to, to be observant to anything until you take the time to understand what it is that you're trying to be observant to. And uh, I think that that speaks volumes to the idea that uh, some of our lodges, uh, they only know what they know. They don't know what they don't know. And that's primarily because of the history and, and the culture that has been handed down from generation to generation. And of course, I, we could probably have a long conversation on how that started. And it go, goes back to brother David Crickard's question of uh, when, when, when did we depart from delivering upon the, the intent and the original aim of Freemasonry? But um, uh, I've, I've lived it, I've seen it. Uh, changing the culture that um, that does not want to be stuck in a rut of just having a boring business meeting and running through the order of business and uh, eating, meeting, and going home. 
um, I found that once uh, the members of those particular lodges get exposure to education, uh, they get hungry for it because it's something that wasn't given to them uh, in, in some instances. Uh, but that's just been my personal experience. Yeah, great comment. Thank you. On the same notion, um, Forest Brother Chad Lasik, you had a great comment here, and I think it's it's relevant to keep on this path with, and then I'll jump over here and, and grab a couple more questions that we have our hand raised. So, Worship Brother Chad, why don't you repeat what you wrote there and add any additional context, if you would. Thank you, Worship Brother Evans. Uh, great to see you guys again. Uh, I miss you. miss you, too. Uh, so, Brother, there's, you know, there's, there's good news here. Um, I do an awful lot of, of research and, and reading, and I, I dig back as far as I can get with a lot of documents. And it's really interesting. It seems to me, and uh, I'm not claiming to be a scholar uh, to any extent, but it seems to me that since the second meeting of Freemasons, there has been this same sort of refrain of we're straying from the things that we're supposed to be doing. and. I think that just boils down to uh, differences of opinion. And, and, you know, there's certain people that think that whatever they call traditional uh, is being profaned or it's being watered down or, you know, we're, we're not on the path that we're supposed to be. Uh, but the truth is that we are exactly on the path. And although each of us might interpret that path differently, the best way for any of us to encourage others to participate in the kind of Freemasonry that we think we ought to be participating in is to do so by example. And so if you yourself are practicing Freemasonry in a certain way, you will attract men who admire you to follow in your path. So we don't need this big programs. We don't need the Grand Lodge to come down and, and create anything for us. Uh, it really is just a, the, you know, the, the very basic um, the process that we've been going through for centuries of if you, if you see someone you admire, you're going to emulate them. And, and I think that's the good news is that what they've been complaining about straying from the traditional practices from the very beginning. Uh, the founding fathers complained about that, and they, they lamented whether or not our fraternity would survive. And yet here we are, and we're still complaining, and we're still lamenting, and we're still doing all the exact same things. Mm -hmm. And so I would suggest to all of you, just set all those things to the side, because we know we do them forever, and focus on the good things, and lead by example. Well said. John, you want to add anything else to that? I agree with Chad. Good to see you tonight, Chad. Um, whatever you're going to uh, do in the path you follow, follow it. Be the example. Doesn't make any difference what it is. Uh, I think we have enough experience now after uh, close to 300 years to realize that the fraternity is not going to change in our generation. There's always going to be pockets of men who want more. They want a different experience. They should be allowed to pursue those pockets within the Constitution and the bylaws of their jurisdiction, and most of the time they are. If they want to pursue something different, let them do that. And as I said earlier, I don't think anybody's looking to criticize what somebody else does any more than we want criticism from them to criticize what we may do. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be Freemasons. We're supposed to be tolerant of the issue of why we're here. The only thing I would add to what uh, Chad's comments were is, should we at least not start with the same foundation? and go from there. And I think that's where the differences are. We don't start with the same foundation. And boy, that's difficult to do in an organization that has expanded as rapidly and created the cultures that it has as American Freemasonry. So John, elaborate on that a little bit further on the, on the foundation, please. Well, how, how, can we, how can we expect men not to make Freemasonry what they believe it is if they aren't instructed what it is with a foundation that's uniform 
And that's been the crux of the struggle since uh, uh, the beginning of most Grand Lodges, determining what Freemasonry is for their jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And we, we have the core, we, we can bumble our way through a, a description that might satisfy most of us tonight as to what Freemasonry is, but it's never been fully agreed upon on how to present it. It's never been fully agreed on what to present and what to adopt, thus accounting for our many rituals and our many practices mm -hmm. uh, and every Grand Lodge having their own sovereign in interpretation of what it should be for their subordinate lodges. But I believe if we're going to have it, it, it's basic training is what it amounts to. Um, what organization doesn't offer some basic training to every person that comes into their organization? Mm -hmm. At least start them off on one foot. Now, they may end up on another, and mm -hmm. they can pursue and speculate all they want, but at least give them the basics to start with. And getting to that uniformity is going to be awfully difficult for the entirety of American Freemason. Good point. Brother David, Osvat, go ahead. Thank you, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Great, I'm a 50 year plus Mason. I uh, was raised in 1970. My dad was a post-World War II Mason when it was flourishing. Um, I remember the day my blindfolds was taken off in our third degree. I looked around and I thought, I was a senior in college at that time. And I looked around and I looked and these are a bunch of old white guys. I'm here, I'm in college, you know, it was going on in the seventies, all sorts of um, uh, revolt, Vietnam, equal rights uh, uh, and whatnot. And I thought, this doesn't look like what I thought we were. Although my, you know, I knew my dad's friends and they were Masons and they were brothers. And that's one reason I did. And so after I went in the service, came home, got you know, his education, uh, couldn't spend any time in Masonry because I was at kids and I'm taking classes at night. So once I retired, I got active in Masonry, but still, and things were better in, in my lodge. I went to the chairs and became master. But I've helped form uh, a, a TO lodge in Columbus, Ohio called Arts and Sciences. I've uh, since retired down to North Carolina and a member of Sophia. So two issues that do you think when you look at uh, Brother, uh, <clears throat> Brother Bizak, when you look at the TO lodges, which traditionally have high dues and so what that's saying is if you want what we have you've got to pay for this because it's high, higher dues it's and my experience says that's maintained what we do what we try to experience and who we bring in as speakers and, and all of that so secondly in a TO lodge or any lodge if they're going to get in some really deep education pieces and it gets esoteric does that conflict with some of our mason brothers with their religious beliefs well as far as the dues goes you're absolutely right how do you pay for what you're trying to pursue if you don't have the money to pay for it and I'm not familiar with every lodge in the nation that refers to themselves as an observance lodge or a hybrid or any other category, but I doubt if there's any that have dues that are $40 because you can't pursue that kind of masonry on $40 a year with 50 or 60 members or even 200 members. You can't pursue what lodges try to do who are practicing observant masonry. So I think you're right. Uh, I do are necessary. I don't think they're designed to keep anybody out. But if you're pursuing that kind of Freemason, uh, most likely in most lodges, you're going to pay a lot more than you will in the ordinary uh, lodge. Uh, as far as the esoteric side of Freemason, I think it stands on the same level of, of um, acceptance as observant Mason. 
or Masonic lodges do. If brothers want to go completely esoteric, uh, they should have their opportunity to do that. I don't think there's anything that should prevent that any more than they should stand around saying this is the only path you can follow in Freemasonry. It's not. Mm -hmm. It is not the only path. But we'll go back to what Chad said. If you're going to follow it, do it well. Be an example in that path. And then other men can make choices as whether or not they want to pursue them or not. Um, I think many men in this room probably know other Masons who are perfectly content to remain in a blue lodge, no appendant body affiliation, no esoteric Freemasonry, uh, nothing at all. Some will even say, I can't learn all there is to learn at the blue lodge. How am I supposed to go someplace else? And some will say, I still don't understand what I'm doing in this blue lodge. And they'll be honest about it. Mm -hmm. But again, I, I like Chad's approach. Uh, if you're going to do that, brothers, be the best at it as you can and serve as the example for others so they have choices too. Yeah, well said. Thank you. Uh, Brother John Cameron, go ahead, sir. Thank you, Brother Evans. I, I, if I may, I have a, a comment and then a question. So the, we're talking about a general malaise, and the sense I'm getting is because most of you are resident in the United States. I'm, a, I'm resident in Canada. So this issue is, is North American, in my opinion. And I recall listening to Brother Jackson many times relating about his travels to foreign countries and, and his experiences Freemason and Freemasonry in those countries. And this issue, this malaise, from what I've heard from Brother Jackson, is a North American concept. The places that he has been to, Germany and, and uh, South America and so on, um, altogether different Masonic experience. So to, uh, to, to say that this is a universal issue, um, I, I don't think is quite correct. So I, I heard a young lady uh, a number of years ago <laughs> when uh, I was in a, a bar talking to a friend and she said to her friend, I don't want to marry Prince Charming. I'll be happy with one of his drinking buddies. So that, that sort of typifies to me um, what is going on in Freemasonry. So uh, the word that uh, Brother Bizak that you, you used in presentation for your discussion was elitist. So, and, and the, typically that's a charge that, that's, that's laid uh, to members of, of traditional observant lodges. I'm just curious as to your thoughts on terms of why um, the, the brothers call a traditional observant lodge elitist. Don't we all strive to be Prince Charming? Yeah, I think we all do that, uh, John. Um, well, I also said when I was speaking about that, it's two or three other things that were taken out of context or misinterpreted because of the lack of information about what it is they were criticizing. And if there's a stark contrast where somebody says, well, that's an observant lodge, they, they wear ties and coats and tuxedos, and somebody says, well, that's elitist, uh, most likely that guy's going to be from a lodge that doesn't wear anything close to that. And it's very casual in this approach. And if that's what his lodge wants, so be it. But elitism, I think, is an escape or a scapegoat of just saying you don't know really. When you're talking about this issue, you really just don't know much about it. So it's easier to just criticize and be, be correct. Your, uh, your comment about masonry over the world, you're right about Tom. Uh, I don't know anybody that has more experience of traveling around the world and visiting lodges than Tom did. But uh, yeah, what we're talking about tonight is about American Freemasonry for sure. It's not about masonry in Canada or Europe or Africa or any place else. This is American Freemasonry. And it has its own unfolding of history and its own baggage, so to speak, that was uh, dropped soon after the colonies won the war and we became our own country. We started collecting our own baggage. We didn't bring all of England's with us. So, Brother Bizak, just to interrupt, the, 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 the uh, key to what I was, was wanted to say was that, in fact, 
it's North American Freemasonry. This, this, this malaise, Canadian Freemasonry is no different than the Freemasonry that I've observed in visits to, uh, to the United States. Yeah. So it, this is a North American cultural um, malaise, I believe. The bowling, uh, bowling alone uh, is, could be just as appropriate here in my home province as it may be where uh, the author lived, so. Sure. Yeah, good point, good point. Thank you, John. <clears throat> uh, Worship Brother Tom Nitsky, go ahead. Brother John, excellent presentation tonight. Uh, Thank you. Early on in your, in your presentation, you said that, you know, as for like a Master Mason, that we, we focus or celebrate the event rather than the process. And I kind of look at it as when I was made an officer and I received my badge, I knew there was several things that I had to go through educational wise, academy, field training, and the lifelong learning through the department. Where as a Mason, we receive our badge, an apron. Where do we fall short or why do we fall short of the process of that celebration, that culture, that that it's something special that we need to learn. Why do we fall short there? Well, I think if we go back, Tom, and look at uh, how it unfolded just in Kentucky, we find that the instruction in Kentucky was one of the problems of why Kentucky asked to become a Grand Lodge from Virginia. And the problem was distance. And the problem was not being able to visit lodges to see if they were even following the um, constitution. So they asked Virginia, let us form our Grand Lodge here. We have five lodges, a sufficient amount, and we can expand from there and so forth. So they did. And the very first thing they started complaining about after they did it is we don't have, we can't get to the lodges that we've uh, chartered on the other end of the state or even 60 miles away. But we have to remember, you know, this is 1800. And we have the same problem now that Virginia had when we were part of Virginia. And at the same time, there started one of the first rapid expansions in the Freemasonry by members and expansion of lodges. So it got away from us. And one of the things that happened in 1833 in Kentucky was that a part of the bylaws that had stood since 1802 was abolished in 1833. Now, this is a few years after the Morgan affair, and that had some effect on things, I'm sure. But in 1833, they decided, let's strike this section of our bylaws and continue on. That section they struck was it was no longer required to talk about Freemasonry in a Masonic Lodge during state of communications. Where for the first 31 years, it was required that the master give lectures or see that lectures were given. And we discussed Freemasonry in Lodge. But in 1833, they abolished it, and we can see it rapidly how quickly that was forgotten about within the next three or four years of the 1830s because they just quit talking about masonry. It went to something else altogether. They didn't have to talk about it anymore. And there are still degrees, and there are still openings and closing and lectures, of course, with the degrees, but no more talking about Freemasonry. And we don't have any records to show that there was ever any specific proficiency classes. We have um, uh, an awareness and, and records that in the uh, 1700s, it was a different kind of proficiency altogether, of course. And in some lodges, it was just the master asking a few questions. There was no memory work. Well, you might have to memorize what the answer might be, but there was no memory work like we do it today. So we got away, so far away from it that by, by the uh, 1840s, we had already started saying, There's lodges that aren't even doing proficiencies. They're just raising people at the end or initiating passing and raising, and that's it. They're just passing them on to the next degrees. There are lodges, a lot of lodges in Kentucky that did that. And evidence of that is throughout our proceedings because Grand Masters complained about it year in and year out. Uh, that was finally something that was corrected. But I think once we get away from the idea that you bring them in, you rush them through the degree and they'll pick it up as they go along. Gave way to the fact that 
where are we really making sure that we're providing a foundation beyond ritual, which we already established as early as 1840, was slovenly and incapable un 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 of being understood, as one grandmaster said it, in most lodges. We've already established that was done away with. So correcting our proficiencies can only be done with better education and better instruction in class and providing a formal central uniform foundation, however brief it might be, it needs to be provided to all members who come in before they start deciding what they want to do with their police <clears throat> masonry and what it is. Would you say that that foundation is, it probably begins as simply with the tracing boards with degrees? Well, if we have members who cannot identify any symbols on a tracing board, they probably didn't have much of a Masonic instruction through their degrees. That, that, that would be the very minimum, I would think. Absolutely. And as, and as someone who's who has set up structured degree classes and talked to other jurisdictions where there's many members who've done the same thing, and everybody steals each other ideas that works best for them, which is what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Very rarely is there any section of these degree classes anywhere in this country that leaves out tracing boards. It's in there somewhere. The big variance is which tracing board are you using? Because we have so many different ones from which to select, as you know. Our past speaker, Mark St. Cyr says, what's a tracing board? And then he went on to say, sorry, I couldn't help it. So I think we know his, uh, <laughs> his humor. Um, <clears throat> so um, from my experience, and John, I think you most certainly agree, probably ma masonry is unique and it's a product of our time. It's a product of our location. It's a product of the people. It's a product of their knowledge and um, and, and, and education. It's a product of the leadership of the lodge. It's a product of the members of the lodge. And, and being a product of the members of the lodge leads me over to um, Worst Brother Jerry Smith, who has a couple comments about guarding the West Gate. So Worst Brother Gerald, you wanna you wanna take it away from that for a moment? Sure. Um, you you uh, Brother Brian were uh, in my lodge uh, last month, and uh, you remember us going down the memorial staircase there and the 135 year history of that uh, lodge mm -hmm. in South Pasadena, California. And um, it was right after the celebration of that anniversary that we that that lodge started going in the direction of being an observant lodge. And um, everybody heard my my detailed views about what an observant lodge is and does and why a couple months ago when I talked about uh, observant masonry. Current talk that I'm giving um, and that I gave at, at our lodge um, is now on guarding the West Gate. And um, I think that that is uh, where the uh, beginning step is on being able to, to convert an established lodge. And uh, at, our, at our lodge now, you have, to, you have to come to our lodge regularly for six months and get to know a lot of people in the lodge and have a lot of them know you. And we have special sessions for this kind of, kind of thing. But that's before we'll give you a petition. And what we're trying to do during that preparatory time isn't to, to convince you to come to our lodge, it's to help you find the right fit for you. We know a lot of other lodges, they come to our lodge because we, we have events that, that draw people far beyond our, our lodge. And uh, we, we want to get them into our lodge if they're interested in our program and they get very well acquainted with what it is. And it's going to take not just the six months to get a petition, but it takes two years to go through the degrees because they go through in groups of anywhere five, from five to eight. 
There are four classes that they have to go through between each degree. They have to do a certain amount of reading, attend a certain amount of events. They have to make a presentation to the Blue Lodge before they move on. So if, if you want to go through that, if that's what you want, then, then this is the right lodge for you. But if that's not what you want, uh, I'll even take a brother to a, to, to a social thing at another lodge that I think is a better fit for him. And um, the way that it's working is, you know, there are older members, the old white guys, and I happen to be one of those old white guys that you see at my lodge when the, uh, when the, the, the official uh, first hoodwink comes off of you. But what we're working at is building up from the bottom, uh, guys that this is what they're coming to the lodge for and actually diverting people that are not interested to, to other lodges. You're, you're not obligated to become a scholar once you get through, but having gone through it, we're finding that they are amenable to and supportive of what we're doing. And, and the, the few old codgers that really feel offended by it are going to age out. And eventually, we're going to be purely a, um, an observant lodge, I think. But it's, it's a long and patient process, as is uh, smoothing your ashlar after you come into Freemasonry. So um, I, would, uh, I would ask you, uh, Brother Bizek, I, I, I maintain now that um, the very first of the of uh, uh, Brother Hammer's eight steps to excellence is guarding the West Gate, and for very good reason. And uh, I wonder if you might like to uh, expand on that a little bit. Sure, I, I think it fits right into the theme, Jerry. The guarding the West Gate is exactly what didn't happen in the five periods of rapid expansion in American Freemasonry, which overwhelmed the fraternity that kept it from doing what it should do, which is basically instruct Masons on how to be Freemasons and what Freemasonry is. We can have cite many examples that the West, Guard wasn't gated, or West Gate wasn't guarded. I believe David Estes, who's with us tonight, uh, is one of the, um, well, he is the most active uh, an engaged, uh, longest serving member we have in the lodge. And when was that in the seventies, Dave? Yes, I, I should be 50 years uh, last month. I know you and I've talked about this before, but I know how you said how busy the lodge seemed to be on everything except Freemasonry <laughs> for many years. And I, I would say, Gerald, that is guarding the West Gate has to be at the top of the list. It has to start there. And uh, Brother John, uh, I want to also uh, thank you for, for your presentation. And um, I'll just mention that uh, I was uh, reading and then rereading your book that really got me thinking about uh, uh, making a, a talk on guarding the West Gate, because that's a, a lot of it I, I, I gleaned out of, out of what you were having to say, the indiscriminate just bringing anybody in and and we we've brought in several people who had already been offered a uh, petition on their first or second visit to another lodge and and then then came to our lodge and uh, after they uh, found out what kind of rigorous process it was to come into our lodge that's where they went sure or that's where they came sure we found just in the past uh, few months that as we tell petitioners, it may take as long as 24 weeks to go through each of our structured degree classes, that that has a deterrent effect as well and tells us a lot about the time they're willing to devote even after they learn what those classes are and what the purpose of them. Mm -hmm. Brothers, there are some great comments in the chat. <clears throat> if you have a chance to go back and read those when you have some time before we finish up here this evening. Um, last call for any any uh, questions or comments for Worship Brother Bizak. Yes, Mario, go ahead. Mario, go ahead. Floor is yours. Can you hear me? There you go. Yep. 
Gotcha. Yeah, I, it seems I may have some trouble with my microphone. No I don't. Okay, so um, I could say um, I'm a junior member of the Brotherhood. I am truly interesting, interested in you know learning. Um, this is why I'm here, and I think it's uh, it's very important that at least I have the idea that there should be a balance between conserving our heritage and you know using whatever technology and means we can just keep up keep up with times because things have changed a lot but that doesn't mean that we cannot still preserve what we have what we use whatever means we can to get together i mean what i see here is that i i am a new member i have no experience i have i know very little even though i consider myself a person who um, has a little background on on esoteric knowledge, even though um, I still need the guidance of people who are older than me, you know, because I, as we have said, or we were heard tonight, I don't really know what I don't know. <laughs> so in the end, it's very important, I think, that we all uh, try to devise a way, because this is a, I, I love this idea, this is a very beautiful evening a very with a very beautiful intention and I think it should be kept and you know now that we can actually meet from far away and perhaps stay like this this plant this seed and make it spread to all the people who want to just you know adhere to the idea of learning more about Freemasonry. I I, I want to say that I have I started reading uh, brother John's book and I found it you know illuminating for me since I have no instruction and and like in the roots of Freemasonry in North America um, or in the United States, but um, as well, I, I, I wish I could expand more on more topics. So, uh, well, the idea of Freemasonry and being behaving as an island, you know, to observe different um, traditions and whatever we are, we are believing our foundation is, I think we should we should try to expand that, you know, and always just invite people who are willing to come up and well, you know, endure the degree work if it, if it's if we call it that, you know, which is the process of acquiring new knowledge. And I think I think it's a it's very important that at least if we are trying, we we should stay together and just you know build on this. And I, I absolutely appreciate and love what you are doing, and I congratulate you all for this um, sort of you know event because I, I find it truly truly truly. Um, at least uh, it, it could become a passion for me, you know, this this learning process. So um, I thank you for that. And and brother John, please uh, keep on writing because <laughs> I find your your books very very illuminating. As I said, thank you. Thank you, Mario. Yeah, thank you, Mario. Mario, is this your first time joining us? Yes, sir. It is. Okay. And where are you from? Um, I was raised in. in uh, Mutual Lodge, number okay. 896, a few months back. Okay. And I'm, well, you know, I live in Louisville, Kentucky. Great. Good to, good to see you. Yeah, don't worry. Uh, Brother Bizag will keep writing. I think he writes approximately 1,743 words a minute. So don't worry about that. You'll be fine. <laughs> Great to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, John, I have one other question for you. Yeah. What has Freemasonry most taught you? What have you learned from Freemasonry? What 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 has been the primary impact Freemasonry has had on your life since you joined? Well, it's, it's revitalized. I spent my career in criminal justice, so it revitalized my my um, impression of uh, society, at least parts of it. Uh, but what I've gotten most from it is I can feel a sense of more tolerance toward many things, not just toward people, but toward many things. And I get much more patient because of how slow Freemasonry actually moves and should move. I, I could spend an hour, but I won't try to answer that now. <laughs> um, I think Brother Crickard, is asking me to have to ask you one more question. John, what come you here to do? You know, we, we do this in every class and um, <laughs> uh, we go through what came, what, 
what did you come to Freemasonry to do? And we all we all know the answer to that. But we, we in every class we have somebody that we ask them every time they come to class, and we're we suffice with two words. What do we come to Freemasonry to do, David? To learn. That's right. To learn. Very good. And we believe that's the beginning of the foundation of our structured degree classes. That's why we are having them. Great. Thank you, brothers. Well, John, it's been a pleasure to have you here this evening. Um, I want to make everybody aware, if you don't mind, uh, of your resources, uh, some that you have now and some that are coming soon. For those of you that don't know, uh, John has written many, many books on Freemasonry and other topics, leadership as well. They're all very good. And here's a, a short list of his books from Island Freemasonry, Sins of Our Masonic Fathers, The Age of Unreason, about the Morgan Affair, uh, A Candle in the Dark that he co-wrote with our very own worship brother, Dan Kimball, uh, How and Why Freemasonry Came to Kentucky, The Lexington Experience, uh, specifically about Lexington Lodge Number 1, Notable Men in Kentucky Who Happened to be Freemasons, for the Good of the Order, Discovering Freemasonry, Taking Issue, uh, Summarizing History of Lexington Lodge Number 1, among many others. And these can all be found at thecraftsman.org. Uh, his website, I believe, is going under uh, some very extensive uh, redesign and reconstruction for the purpose of providing more light and education about Freemasonry. But all of these topics can be found there. So feel free to go check those out. Uh, and I believe they're mostly available for purchase if you're interested on Amazon.com, and those links will take you there. Uh, he has a few other books coming up. So, John, sorry, I'm going to self-promote you uh, just for a few. The first one is The Canker Worm on the Rose, The Struggle to Find Uniformity in the Observance of Freemasonry. Would you want to just talk about that briefly for a moment for those that may not be aware of that? Uh, sure. This is a uh, book that will be out in the fall. It is a book exclusively about the evolution of uh, uh, Freemasonry in Kentucky uh, since 1800. It um, allows the people who uh, most influenced it uh, to a large degree, which are the grand masters of the Grand Lodge, who every year made an address to the craft and had programs and gave um, a lot, many times gave their assessment of the condition of the craft. So um, in the book, they speak. And you can see exactly what the struggle was. And the canker worm on the rose is a, a comment of a grandmaster in 1866 who said that uh, expanding Freemasonry as rapidly as we have uh, is like a canker worm on the rose. The rose looks healthy, but it's being daily decayed by allowing too many into the craft and not educating them. And then you have another one here coming out, I believe, in the fall as well, called Bending Granite, a search for difference-making path in American Freemasonry. You want to talk about that for a moment? Uh, that's just a collection of essays, uh, about uh, 20 or so essays in that. That'll be out sometime probably before Tanker Worm on the Ropes. Great. We appreciate the education that you provide to our craft and uh, the light that you share and your friendship and brotherhood uh, for everyone here. I think we can all agree and appreciate and thank you collectively for being a part of our fraternity. So thank you. Appreciate it, Brian. Thank you, brothers. So brothers, next month, we have a brother from Lexington Lodge number one, Steve Peterson. Steve was supposed to be with us a previous meeting, but uh, had a scheduling conflict. So he'll be coming back, I believe, uh, next meeting. He's supposed to be around and he was a music instructor uh, professor, and he's going to be speaking specifically about classical music and Freemasonry. So I think it'll be one that you'll very much enjoy and want to attend uh, next meeting. Uh, we also have uh, Rubicon Masonic Society is hosting our annual, bringing back the annual after the pandemic, annual festive board for 2022. Uh, this festive board will be held August 26th in Lexington, Kentucky. If you are interested in attending, then you can follow the link there, rubiconmasonicsociety.com. Um, and you will have to RSVP. The admission is $100. There are some seats left if you're interested, and uh, if you're able to, to travel to us, we would love to have you. Um, it will be at Spindletop Hall in Lexington. Well, if, if you've not been there, it's a beautiful place, and you can see the picture of it there. Uh, that's also where we filmed the majority of uh, the Masonic Table, the Festive Board, the Art of Dining and Freemasonry. Keynote speaker for the Festive Board will be S. Brent Morris, and he's going to be speaking about the six stages of the evolution of American Freemasonry. So 
If you have any questions or interest, feel free to just visit our website and hopefully all the questions will be answered for you there. We also have, uh, on behalf of the Rubicon Masonic Society, we have some new, res new resources that are coming out very soon. The first one is uh, Transactions of the Rubicon Masonic Society. Volume one will be available here probably likely this fall. Uh, Worship Brother Dan Kimball, would you mind if I put you on the spot and just give a brief uh, summary of maybe what, this, what these transactions will be about, please? Sorry, I didn't prepare you. you. You did put me on, so I had to find my unmute button. Um, <clears throat> good evening, brothers. Uh, the transactions, I think there are 35 essays uh, that, that are written by uh, probably about 25 uh, different brothers who are either members or honorary members or frequent guests of the Rubicon Masonic Society. They fall into some different categories. Some are historical in nature. Some are philosophical in nature. Uh, and some are commentaries, and uh, uh, I think uh, that uh, each of them uh, offer some very unique perspectives. Um, one of the um, uh, essays that is uh, that will be published in the transactions is uh, by, a, I believe, a very newly raised uh, Master Mason from Lexington Lodge One, Antonio Mantica. Uh, but he wrote his essay uh, shortly after receiving his entered apprentice degree. And it's titled The View from the Starting Line. It's an excellent essay. It's a great perspective from an entered apprentice mason. And that's going to be published also uh, in one of the uh, upcoming issues of the Journal of the Masonic Society. So we're very proud of our transactions. We're proud of the brothers who uh, contributed to them. And uh, uh, we hope that, uh, that you'll be interested in obtaining a copy. Great. Thank you, Worship Brother. Uh, information about that can be found on our website, Rubicon Masonic Society. Um, and uh, I don't believe we have anything specific on there yet, but if you want to visit that site occasionally, stay tuned and we'll have pre-orders available uh, at some point here in the near future. So uh, another resource which you are already aware of, everyone, is the Masonic Table documentary. It's available for streaming on Amazon Prime for rent or purchase. Uh, we also will have a uh, limited supply of DVDs, which will be available for purchase also specifically for those who will be attending the festive board. Um, and if you do have an interest in a DVD, in addition to the digital streaming copy, you'll just need to let us know uh, and we'll see what we can do to make that happen. But DVDs, for those of you who don't know, <clears throat> they're a disc about this size, very flat, and they go inside this machine that plays it through your TV. Uh, some of you older gentlemen are aware, but some of those younger guys uh, may, may need that description. First of all, Brian, before we close, could you tell us what your program is going to be next month on this series? Yes, sir. Um, I, you must have missed that. Uh, it was uh, oh. Steve Peterson, Classical Music and Freemasonry. Thank you. You bet. <clears throat> All right, any final comments from uh, William O'Ware? Uh, Worship Brother Tom, anything else you would like to add this evening? Uh, just to say uh, a great evening of uh, learning tonight. And uh, uh, next Wednesday, the 31st, our last regular stated meeting will feature uh, Brother John as our as our speaker for the evening. So looking forward to that. So other than that, great night and good, glad to see everyone. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Worship Brother Allen, is there anything from Rubicon that we might need to address or mention that you can think of? Uh, nothing comes to, to mind that we need to mention. I think you've covered it all. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you again to our sponsors and brothers participating. Uh, for those of you that are not aware, Rubicon is a 501c3. Uh, the Internal Revenue Code contributions to us can be made uh, and may be deductible for income tax purposes if you're interested in helping to uh, expand the light of education in Freemasonry, uh, please feel free to donate. Uh, you can scan the code on your screen or visit rubiconmasonicsociety.com slash donate. We would appreciate any and all support. Worship Brother Tom, would you please deliver a closing devotion, sir? Brethren, if you'll join me, Grand Architect of the Universe, Ruler of Heaven and Earth, now that we're about to separate and return to our respective places of abode, will thou be so pleased to influence our hearts and minds that we may, each one of us, practice those great moral duties which are inculcated in Freemasonry and with reverent study and obey the laws which God has given us. Amen. So motivate. So motivate. So motivate.
Brothers, our next meeting is September 26th, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, feel free to invite other brothers to attend and join us, rubiconmasoniccsociety.com slash RSVP. I'm going to close this evening with a very simple rendition of Auld Lang Syne. Hope you all enjoy. Have a great night and look forward to seeing you again next meeting. Thank you, brothers. <laughs> Good night, brothers.